Hey everybody, welcome back. This is chapter three for Chem 103, and we're talking about matter and energy. We are going to escape math this chapter. We're pretty much just talking about concepts that you've likely already gotten from high school, maybe even middle school, only a little bit, you know, elevated because we're in college. We're gonna be talking about the states of matter and how you go back and forth between states. We're gonna characterize matter. It should be pretty easy. Vocab, lots of things to memorize, but not too difficult. So it should be a good break from all the math in chapter two if math is not your jam. All right, now y'all know I always change to black. Sometimes I remember to do it before I start recording. Most of the time I don't. It is what it is. We're starting with defining matter. Matter is any substance that has mass and occupies volume. And it exists in one of these three physical states, solid, liquid, and gas. Nothing that is earth shatteringly new. Let's talk about each of these states. Solids have a definite fixed shape. They can't be compressed and they have a definite volume. Think about something that is a solid say a brick. That brick has a defined fixed shape, right? It's usually rectangular. It has a certain volume. It's not going to expand or contract. You can't really compress it. It's fixed. You'll want to know these terms and you'll want to understand definite, fixed, compressed. These are the types of words we'll use when we're talking about the different states of matter. Liquid state. Liquids have an indefinite shape. It's another word to add to your vocab bank because they assume the shape of their container. Let's say that I had a container that had some water in it. There's my container. There's my water. If I took that same water and I poured it into a flask instead. Don't laugh at my flask. I'm not, a, I'm not an artist, I'm a scientist. If I poured that same water into this flask, it would look like that. Different shapes, it assumes the shape of the container. However, the volume is the same. If this was 100 milliliters, and then I took that and poured it into this flask, it's still 100 milliliters of water. So the volume is definite, but the shape is indefinite. And because that volume is definite, then liquids cannot be compressed. Now we're at the gaseous state. Gases have an indefinite shape, just like liquids. So they assume the shape of their container. But here's the difference. Gases can be compressed and they have indefinite volume. What that means is that gases will expand or compress depending on the container. We'll say the size slash volume of the container. If I had a box that I filled with air and that the volume of the box, let's say it was eight liters, then that would be the volume of my air, eight liters. If I took that box of air and I emptied all the air 
into this bigger box, say it was 24 liters, it was three times larger, then the volume of the gas would then become 24 liters. To go from this small box to the big box, the gas expands. If we were to then go back the other way, the gas would have to compress. Now there's something else that we can talk about when it comes to the states of matter, and that has to do with energy. The kinetic molecular theory, which we'll revisit when we talk about gases specifically, simply states the more energy a substance has, the farther apart its molecules are. I like to draw things out with arrows. It's more, it, it says something easier to my brain for, to digest. If I increase my energy, that's what that up means, then I increase the distance between molecules. That's what the kinetic molecular theory says. Now, how does that apply? Well, in the solid state, all the particles of matter are packed really tightly together. That means that they're going to have low energy because the opposite is true as well. If you have decreased or low energy, then that means you're going to decrease or have a smaller distance between molecules. Solids have the least energy of the three states of matter. And they also have particles that are packed the tightest. For the liquid state, it's kind of in between, right? If you think about water, it's free to move, which means that the molecules in the water are free to move past each other. They're loosely packed. They have less energy than gases but more energy than solids. For gases, the particles are really far apart. They're also uniformly distributed throughout their container. And they have the most energy of the three states of matter. This table summarizes most of what we talked about. So it talks about the, the solids, liquids, and gases and their shape, volume, and whether or not you can compress them. There's also an image here looking at the molecule distance. So distance between particles. For solids, you can see that they're packed tightly. Liquids, it's kind of loose. And gases is far apart. This is where the kinetic molecular theory comes in. So this is a visual of that. This one slide summarizes all that you need to know about the properties of solids, liquids, and gases. But of course we know matter can exist in different states of matter. You can have a solid transition to a liquid and that liquid can become a gas. Most substances can exist as a solid, liquid, or gas. If you think about water, which we'll talk a lot about water in this chapter, just because it's an example that everyone can relate to. It exists as a solid, that's the ice that you put in your cup if you like really cold drinks. It exists as a liquid, wash your dishes, wash your clothes, wash your hands. And as a gas, if you're boiling water because you want to make rice or pasta, or if it happens to be winter time and you use a humidifier, the ones that are warm 
that's boiling water, right? So you get steam. That's all three states of matter. When a solid transitions to a liquid, so if you think about ice becoming water, what happens to it? It melts, right? So here I'm going to start highlighting things. A lot of this, again, is kind of definitions, things that you already know, but we're giving you terms. And you probably already knew melting, so it's not a new term. But when a solid changes to a liquid, that's called melting. When the substance that's melting increases its temperature, it becomes a liquid, right? So that ice, you leave it out. Maybe you have it in a cup that you sit on the counter. You drank what you wanted. You forgot about it. Your phone rang. You walked away. Whatever. It starts to warm up. As it warms up, the temperature increases and the ice melts. Happens all the time to me. When a liquid changes to a solid, that's freezing. So you may not be having gatherings at your home. But when you did, maybe somebody, you know, got a bunch of ice trays from the dollar store, made some ice. Not going to lie and say I haven't done that before. Make some ice, put it into a Ziploc bag. There you go. Don't have to go to the store and buy ice. Buying ice just seems ridiculous to me. As something freezes, the temperature decreases. What I like to do when I have to memorize these kinds of concepts, now again, melting and freezing, that's something you're already familiar with, but I like to draw it out. I think that pictures say a lot, whereas having to read the words over and over, sometimes it just doesn't stick the same, it doesn't hit right. So solid to liquid, and this is just an example, you don't have to do it this way. So you can kind of draw something like that. And then you can also have arrows that talk about the temperature. Increase temperature. Decrease temperature. You can get colorful with markers or highlighters. And doing this kind of thing in your notes as you review will do wonders for retaining the information. Now we're gonna go liquid to gas. You may not have all the terminology for this, but you certainly have the concept. When a liquid changes to a gas, that's called vaporizing. When you vaporize a substance, the temperature increases. The opposite of that going from the gas to the liquid is called condensing. That causes a decrease in temperature. Again, Oops. I like to use arrows and things like that. Liquid to gas vaporize gas to liquid condense and you can do arrows to show increase in temperature and decrease in temperature the last one we'll cover is kind of a cool one to me it's not exactly common but it does happen and you likely have encountered the substance that I'm going to talk about as an example so you can sometimes have a solid changing directly to a gas.
That's called sublimation. When a substance sublimes, the temperature increases. The opposite of that is when a gas changes directly to a solid. That's called deposition. When something undergoes deposition, the temperature decreases. If you have ever gotten ice cream from an ice cream truck, which I know that ice cream trucks are probably as rare as unicorns these days, but they may have used dry ice to keep everything cold. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. Okay, that's CO2. So whenever you see a movie or something and you've got all those flasks with the colored water and you see all the, the vapor coming off of them because it's a mad scientist lab, it's literally water with food coloring and some dry ice in there. And carbon dioxide will go directly from a gas to a solid when it gets cold enough. And in order to keep it as a solid, it's got to be really, really cold. So it will sublime really easily. If you have a little piece of dry ice, dry ice and you can just leave it out and you'll just see it kind of wiggle and look like it's smoking. That's just the creation of carbon dioxide. So there's an example for you. Didn't know that you knew it, but you did. I like this image because it summarizes the state changes with water. So it gives you the, the visual of solid ice, liquid water, and then gas. It also reminds you of the particle packing which you can relate to the energy with that state of matter. Low, medium, and high energy. So this is a great summary slide. I've included a blank slide where you can fill in your own example of solid, liquid, and gas and fill in the vocabulary words and everything like that to make sure you understand how they're all related. You can also add in the energy states like I did and any other information from you know what you know about solids, liquids, and gases into this little chart. So it is, it's a great way to quiz yourself and help you to study. So you can literally print this off you know, a few times, you can make a nice pretty one and then use it to quiz yourself. If you have a tablet or something that you can write on like that, then you can just kind of do it and then wipe it, do it, wipe it. So this is a great tool for you guys. We talked about the states of matter. Now we're moving to the classifications of matter. Remember, matter is just what all the things are made of. Matter can be divided into two classes, mixtures and pure substances. Those are the two big categories. So just to keep us kind of together on this, and I encourage you to have something like this in your notes. Matter can be broken down into mixtures and pure substances. And this chart will help you see how all these terms are related. So we'll keep adding to it as we go. Get my highlighter back. Mixtures. We're talking about a physical blend of substances, at least two. They can be physically separated into its component substances. 
physically. So things like evaporation, filtration, things of that nature. Those are physical methods of separating substances. Pure substances, on the other hand, they're only made of one substance. Cannot be physically separated. Now we're going to break down these two large categories. Let's redraw our little. Now we're working on the, the mixtures. We've got heterogeneous, and homogeneous, or homogeneous. The key here is knowing that for the heterogeneous mixtures, they do not have uniform properties throughout. One example is sand and water. If you have a glass jar or some container that you have both sand and water in, you can see the sand at the bottom and the water at the top. You can just see with your naked eye, there's sand and water in here. And you can physically separate them. You could dry off the water, you could scoop out the sand. So that's a heterogeneous mixture. Another example would be like an ice cream sundae. It's a mixture of things and you can separate all of those things physically. One more example, brass, okay? Brass is made of copper and zinc. But if you're looking at it, you can't see two different metals. So if there are brass fittings or brass instruments, it just looks like one whole piece. And I just gave you an example of a homogeneous mixture by accident. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry, y'all. So that was an example of a homogeneous mixture where you have uniform properties throughout. My brain is trying to skip me ahead to those homogeneous mixtures. But I need to give you one more example of heterogeneous mixture. Another example would be, since I brought up metal, you guys ever see a wishing well? Maybe you saw it on TV in some old movie from the 90s. They were really popular in malls in the 90s for some reason. And with a wishing well, you literally just have a fountain of water or something, or it's, you know, an actual well of water. And people would throw coins in, and you're supposed to make a wish, and something happens, right? Well, metal and water is also a heterogeneous mixture. But if we move on to the homogeneous mixtures... They're uniform. So here, if you can remember one, then you can get the other. So another example of homogeneous mixture would be salt water. If I put out a glass of salt water next to a glass of just regular old drinking water, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference unless you tasted it. So with a homogeneous mixture, remember, you can still physically separate it. You can evaporate that water off and be left with the salt. But you can't just by looking at it see there's the salt, there's the water. The salt and water are mixed thoroughly and it's uniform throughout. So that was the mixtures. Now we'll do the other half. 
the pure substances. Those can be broken down into elements and compounds. Compounds can be chemically separated into individual elements. Chemically separated, different from physical. An example would be water. You can, f you can separate water into hydrogen and oxygen, and hydrogen and oxygen are individual elements that you find on the periodic table. But you can't separate that hydrogen and oxygen just by heating the water or filtering the water. Then we have elements. They cannot be broken down any further by chemical reactions. Anything that's on the periodic table is an element. So remember, let me put this in a different color. Compounds can be chemically separated into elements. And I would recommend adding that little arrow or something showing how compounds and elements are related. This is the summary. So yes, I had the slide in here, but I think it's more helpful to like draw it as you go to, and then also have this summary in your notebook. There are examples of each of these smaller classes of mixtures and pure substances. So for a heterogeneous mixture, we've got oil and water. Homogeneous, we've got salt water, which what's shown is an IV. And that's got sodium chloride. Then for a compound, we just have plain old liquid water. And then we have an element, which that's gold foil. Make sure that you understand not just the definitions of these, but that you're able to give examples. There's a lot of elements that occur in nature. Good number of them that we know about are also stable. Only 10 elements account for more than 95% of the mass of Earth's crust, water, and atmosphere. And that's kind of crazy when you think about how large the Earth is. Most of it is comprised of only 10 different elements. So there's some fun facts there. I'm not going to quiz you on this on, home, on um, exams, but you may see some of this on Mastering Chemistry. We have elements in our bodies because we are matter. Oxygen is the most common element in both the Earth's crust and in our bodies. Silicon is the most abundant, the second most abundant with Earth, but for us, it's carbon. We are carbon, okay? Oxygen and carbon. We need them both. Each element has a unique name and a unique symbol. That chemical symbol, you're going to see that on the periodic table. Some, some elements have a one-letter symbol, some have a two-letter symbol. When you have two-letter symbols, the first letter is capitalized, and the second one is lowercase. And I'll show you some examples of that. The names of these elements have various origins, Latin, Greek, you name it. 
named after people who discovered them. So it's kind of all over the place with the names. But the elements themselves can be divided into three different classes. So just to remind you kind of where we are, you can add to that summary table. Oh, we did pure substances over here. Elements. And compounds. So now we're adding on to elements. We've got metals, non-metals, and semi-metals. We'll talk about each of these classes. Metals are typically solids. There are some exceptions. But they're typically solid and they have a really high melting point, really high density, and they have this kind of bright, shiny, metallic luster, right? So we'll put shiny in parentheses. Metals are really good conductors of heat and electricity and they're ductile and malleable. Ductile means that you can draw it out into a thin wire. So I'll give you an example electricity using it right now run my computer run my tablet lights on in my office how we're getting all of that power to you know a home or an office we're using a really good conductor there are copper lines and there are aluminum lines for those electrical poles outside that bring a lot of power, juice, if you will, to your home or your office, pretty much anywhere that you go, right? Those wires have large metal cores in them. And that metal is a really good conductor of electricity because it has to travel long distances to get from the plant producing the energy to the consumer like you in your home or your apartment or if you're at the grocery store has to get there so it travels through the metal okay because you have to make these wires you have to extrude the metal into these long thin wires that means that they're ductile they're malleable you can do a lot to them and they won't break the opposite of metals, we have nonmetals. So if you can remember the properties of metals, just think the opposite, and that's a nonmetal. Nonmetals have low melting points, low densities, dull appearance. An example of that would be if you think about pencil lead, which is actually carbon. graphite it's kind of dull right it snaps really easily so it's not malleable or ductile it's actually quite brittle and they're very poor conductors of heat and electricity Then we have semi-metals or metalloids. Those are just kind of in between. So they exhibit properties of metals and non-metals, but there is no list of properties that all semi-metals have. It's just that, well, it's a mixture of metals and non-metals. So an example would be silicon. So silicon is a semiconductor. It will only conduct electricity under some conditions. There are other semi-metals that are, you know, maybe they're shiny, some that are dull, some that are brittle. So there's no set list of properties. It's just a mixture of metal and non-metal properties. 
This table summarizes the characteristics of metals and nonmetals. Now this table is just kind of a, a general table. There are always exceptions. But in general, if you have a metal, it will follow that these different characteristics will describe it well. Same with nonmetals. All of these elements, metals, nonmetals, semi-metals, appear in the periodic table of elements. And they're arranged in increasing order by atomic number. We'll talk more about what the atomic number is in chapter four. Right now, we're just giving you some basics. This is an example of a periodic table. There are many different periodic tables. You will probably see different periodic tables just in this class alone. There's a lot of information that you can get from the periodic table. And I'll tell you some of the things that you get here on this periodic table. So as I stated, we've got all of the elements listed in increasing atomic order from left to right. That arrow means increasing. So increasing atomic order. Atomic number order, excuse me. The majority of the periodic table consists of metals. And in this periodic table, all of the metals are in purple. The semi-metals are green and the non-metals are yellow. So the semi-metals, that's the smallest group, followed by the non-metals, which are on the far right, and then metals is pretty much everything on the left and it goes for the majority of the periodic table. So you will need to have an idea of Okay, where are the metals? Where are the non-metals? Where are the semi-metals? And if I gave you, say, okay, calcium, where is calcium? You'll have a periodic table that has the name of each element spelled out. You would be able to find calcium and say, oh, okay, it's at, it's at the leftmost side of the table. So that means that it is probably a metal. Likewise, if I asked you, okay, if I'm looking at the far right side of the periodic table, these elements are most likely to be, and you tell me, oh, they're most likely to be nonmetals. You can also look at these elements in terms of their physical state. So now the coloration has changed. We've got solids in purple, liquids in blue, and gases in yellow. Notice how, and this is for 25 degrees Celsius, so kind of a little bit above room temperature. Notice how most of the elements are solids. There's only a couple of liquids and a handful of elements that are gases. That's something that you should know too. Not necessarily what are the exceptions, but the fact that most of the elements are solids at 25 degrees Celsius, which is a approximately room temperature, a little bit warmer. You can have really detailed periodic tables that tell you how malleable something is, the <laughs> whether it's a liquid, a solid, or a gas, you can have, whether it's radioactive, all kinds of things on the periodic table. And we'll also learn in chapters four and five other information that can be gleaned from the periodic table. So that's, that's on the horizon. Notice how there's kind of a little bit of a stop. Okay, we've got this many elements, but scientists still discover new heavier elements that exist beyond our current periodic table. 
still figuring out how to name them. We're people, so people can't agree on anything. It takes them a while to do so. So until real names are agreed upon, they'll use a Latin name with the number followed by a suffix I-U-M. So until then, until they figure out how to name these things, because remember, if someone discovered it, maybe they want it to be named after them, but somebody else says, no, well, I discovered it first, or no, we should name it after this person. So there's a lot of pointing and hand-waving and rah, rah, rah about naming these elements because it's once you name an element, it, you don't rename it. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, I think I want to rename my car. I don't want it to be named Dorothy anymore. Maybe I'll call it Angelica. Like, it's it's not that easy. Now we'll talk about a few of the laws that are associated with elements and some of the laws that you'll need to understand moving forward with our class. The law of definite composition states, compounds always contain the same elements in a constant proportion by mass. It's kind of wordy, sounds really complicated. It's not, here's my translation. Every compound will always have the same composition, no matter where you find it, no matter how much of it you have. So if you think about water, water is H2O. It's got two hydrogens, one oxygen atom. No matter how much water you have, no matter where you find that water, it will always be H2O. That's what the law of definite composition is saying. Units of matter that are composed of two or more non-metal atoms, it's called a molecule. We're going to do more with naming and chemical formulas in Chapter 6. But again, Chapter 3 is really setting the foundation for the next several chapters that we're going to cover. A chemical formula is what we use to express the number of atoms of each element that's in a compound. And remember, a compound is... A pure substance right so it can only be chemically separated into elements it cannot be physically separated so here's some examples of chemical formulas we've got sulfuric acid which is h2so4 that means that there are two atoms of hydrogen one atom of sulfur and four atoms of oxygen notice how there's no subscript which the numbers down below, those are called subscripts. No subscript when there is only one. Of a given element. Anything more than one, you have a subscript. So let me circle one of these guys. That's a subscript. So again, in words on the slide, for some of you who like that, the number of each type of atom in a molecule is indicated with this subscript in a chemical formula. If there's only one atom of a certain type, you don't use a one, okay? Here's another example for writing chemical formulas. If I told you that vitamin B3 has six carbon atoms, six hydrogen atoms, two nitrogen atoms, and one oxygen atom, you should be able to write the chemical formula. But you'll need to look at the periodic table and find all of the different symbols for each of these elements. Carbon is C, hydrogen is H, nitrogen is N, oxygen is O. Then you fill in the subscripts. There are six carbon atoms, so that means you put a six for the subscript. Six hydrogen atoms, you put a six. Two nitrogen atoms, you put a two. There's only one oxygen atom, so we don't put a subscript for that.
and that's how you write a chemical formula. When you see chemical formulas, sometimes you'll see parentheses. And the parentheses are just there to help clarify the composition of the atom, right? So it'll tell you how things are arranged. And in this case, we're putting the O and the H, the oxygen and the hydrogen together, because that's what's called a functional group. And these two things are bonded to each other and then bonded to something else. So this just gives the reader a little bit more information about how the molecule is put together. Also notice that you can have a subscript outside of the parentheses. So I'm gonna take this part and blow it up a bit more. What that means is everything in the parentheses, you're multiplying by two. Just like in math, if I had a number outside of parentheses, I'm multiplying everything in the parentheses by two. So this means that I have two oxygens and two hydrogens. If, let's say, I had this in parentheses, and I put a two out here. That's still two times everything. So we would have two nitrogens, but then we would have six oxygens. And that's because we were doing O3 plus another O3, which means that we've got six oxygen atoms. So if there is an element within the parentheses that has its own subscript, you need to multiply that subscript by the number on the outside of the parentheses. You have to do that when you're accounting for how many atoms of each element are in a, a compound. We'll do some practice in class, so don't worry if you're still kind of like, mm, don't get it. Don't worry. Always will do practice. Now we have to talk about physical and chemical properties. Physical properties are characteristic of a pure substance that you can observe without changing its composition. There's a whole list of examples. Appearance, so it could be color, right? Whether something is shiny or dull, all those things are appearance. Melting and boiling points, density, heat, solubility, all of those things are physical properties. So think about it if you were looking for a house or you're looking at apartments, all of the physical properties of that location would be, okay, how many bedrooms does it have? Does it have carpet or hardwood floors? Is there tile? Um, how many restrooms are there? Is there a kitchen? How big is it? You know, the dimensions of the place. All of those things are physical properties, just like things you would observe for a pure substance. We also have chemical properties. Chemical properties just describe what a substance can do, how it reacts with other substances. So if I take paper, it can burn if I have oxygen and a, a source for a spark. That tells me it can do this type of reaction. If something can oxidize, that's a reaction. The similar way you can think about this in terms of the house or apartment example is, okay, what is the potential of the space? Oh, okay, I can paint that wall here. I can rip up this carpet. That's the potential. You know what you can do with the place, but it's not done yet. So you're making changes to the place, but it's kind of in your mind. You know, you've got your HGTV decorator in your brain going, okay, I can, I can do this. I can do that. I can knock out that wall. You know, they always knock out walls. I don't, that's, that's a lot of work, but 
Anyway, that's kind of the same idea as a chemical property. It's talking about the potential that a substance has to do certain types of chemistry or react with other substances. So that was properties. We're talking about the potential. We're talking about what it looks like. With changes, both physical and chemical changes, we're talking about a verb. Something has happened or it's happening. Paper burns. Gasoline combusts. Something is has oxidized, you know, rust on a car. Those are things that are chemical changes. Physical changes might be a state of matter changing from a solid to a liquid or vice versa. Compressing a gas. Those are physical changes. So we're talking about action words here. Physical change, one of the good ways to remember that is you're looking at a change in shape or state. So a change in shape would be like the compressing a gas that's changing the volume. You're not doing anything else to the actual substance, you're just changing the volume. A change in shape could also be cutting something. That's a change. Change in state would be like changing from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas or something like that. A chemical change is a chemical reaction. The composition of the substance that you started with changes to something else. One of my favorite examples is the volcano, right? The one that you make, not like the volcanoes on islands and stuff. We're talking about taking vinegar and baking soda, mixing them together, and you see a reaction. You're making some gas, and if you want it to be super theatrical, you put a little bit of red coloring dye in there, put a little bit of soap so that it bubbles up more. You know, you can make it a whole big thing. That's a chemical change. You're taking the vinegar and the baking soda, mixing them together, and you're forming a gas, and that water has a little bit more in it than just water, okay? Cooking is also a great example of a chemical change. So anytime you have something that is toasted, roasted, caramelized, those are all words that indicate a chemical change. The heat is doing things to the compounds on the surface of the food and changing the composition of those compounds so that they taste different. A piece of white bread that you get just straight out of the package tastes very different from one that you've toasted. You know, either you put it in a toaster or you just did it, you know, in a pan or even in the oven, right? That little bit of brown, that has flavor. And that's because you've changed those compounds on the surface. Cooking is chemistry, y'all. And speaking of chemical changes, there's evidence that you can look for to see whether or not a chemical change has occurred. You don't have to see all three of these examples, but you need at least one for a chemical change. Gas release. If you've ever had like an Alka-Seltzer pill or something like that, and you put it in water and then all those bubbles form, that's a gas. So releasing bubbles... That means you formed a gas and a chemical change has occurred. You can form light, light that you can see, or some light that you can detect with uh, spectrometers, or the release of heat. Either way, you're releasing energy. If you're releasing heat, then it's something that you can feel getting warmer, right? A permanent color change. So you take two clear liquids, you mix them together. Now all of a sudden, you've got something yellow. That's evidence that you have observed a chemical change. But whenever you're doing chemistry, any kind of reaction, there's conservation of mass. So if you take two reactants, which are the things that you're going to mix together, right? 
the masses of those two reactants is always equal to the mass of the products that you make. That's the conservation of mass or the law of conservation of mass. If you have a chemical reaction and you've got your reactants on the left side and you're making some kind of products, you've got the same mass either way. So if your reactions had a mass of 500 grams, then your products will also be 500 grams. Part of what you can make is energy. So it's all accounted for, right? We've got our mass, but maybe we make some kind of energy. We release heat or something like that. Well, there's other types of energy too. There's potential energy, which is the energy that can be stored like in chemical bonds. It can also result from position or composition. Position it might be one that you're most familiar with if you took physics in high school, where there's always the, you know, the ball that's on top of a hill or something like that, and it rolls down. It has potential energy at the top. When it rolls down, it increases in its kinetic energy. And that is energy that matter has as a result of motion. So rolling down the hill, that's kinetic energy. And this little picture of a cannon, which I don't know where they got this from, or why they thought this would be a relatable experience for everyone. It's not the American Revolution. However, we'll use it. At the max height that the cannonball has, it's got potential energy, a lot of it. As it falls, the kinetic energy increases. It's moving, right? And that potential energy decreases until it comes to rest on the grass. So remember when we were talking about the physical states at the very beginning and we talked about the kinetic molecular theory. Remember that all substances have kinetic energy regardless of their physical state. It's just that solids have the lowest kinetic energy because their particles are packed in tightly and they're not really moving around that much. And gases have the greatest kinetic energy because, well, they're spread really far apart. They move around a lot. Temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of a system. And I want to focus on that word average, okay? So if I looked at one molecule or one particle of gas, that's what we're talking about here, the average kinetic energy of a system. So just like we talked about with mass, the mass in a chemical reaction is going to disappear. You're not going to have products that are lighter than the reactants you started with. With energy, it's the same way. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. You can just convert it from one form to another. That's the law of conservation of energy. You may have heard this one in physics if you took physics in high school and you stayed awake. You must have stayed awake to have heard this. There's lots of forms of energy, and here are six of them. Heat, light, chemical, electrical, mechanical, and nuclear. Not going to test you too heavy on this, but it will be part of your Master in Chemistry homework. When we're talking about chemical changes, remember we're talking about chemical reactions. And in that reaction, you have one substance being changed to another. When that happens, there's some kind of, of energy change. You've got energy transforming from one form to another. When you have liquid water and it becomes steam, you've got energy being absorbed and that water, all those particles are absorbing that energy 
And then they say, yay, we can free ourselves and we can be far apart. Conversely, if you're taking that steam and you're cooling it down, then you're going to release energy. And the particles are going to say, you know, we've had our fun. It's time to slow it down a little bit. Let's let's come together. I mean, we still are free agents. We can kind of glide past each other, but it's time to be packed in together. Okay. That's changes in energy. We've got energy being absorbed, energy being released. We can put these two ideas together, the law of conservation of mass and energy. So the total mass and energy of the entire universe is constant. And that comes from Einstein's theory of relativity and the whole e equals mc squared. You've probably heard or seen that in movies when they're, you know, talking about, oh, yeah, we're doing physics talk and stuff. E equals mc squared is usually a part of that because it's something that most people recognize as being math and physics-y, right? The theory also says that mass and energy can be interchanged. So that is why we can lump them together and say that mass and energy are constant. That's it for chapter three. We'll always do practice in class. It'll be more conceptual practice and multiple choice and learning how to answer multiple choice questions, which surprise, surprise, that's a skill. So make sure that you tune into the live lecture for the practice problems, details regarding assignments, exams, all that good stuff. As always, stay safe.